as you guys guessed it, Donnie's not here. Y'all are stuck with me. Yeah. Was that one of my youth? Hey, GP youth, rest of the room. What's my favorite word? Thank you so much. All right. That's two words. It's a compound word. All right. But uh, I promise you guys, no, uh, no math, no math this time, no math questions. Um, we're going to do quantum physics today. No, no we're not. I want to talk to you guys um, about something that a lot of Christians have uh, a tendency to do, and that's we, we lose focus. We, we lose focus very, very quickly because it's kind of human nature to think that nothing gets past us. It's, it's kind of human nature to think that we're, we're never vulnerable, that we're invincible, and we can pretty much see everything. Now, a lot of people in here can see more things than some other people. My, my mom is here today, and she, my gosh, pretty much saw almost everything I did throughout my entire childhood, things that I'm still apologizing for now. But with that, we, we still can't see everything, and it's, it's our nature to think that we can. And what happens is we get an idea of what we think truth is. We get an idea of what we think life should be like, and we think that way. Well, you add billions and billions of people on the planet, you have billions and bi billions of different ways of looking at life. And the problem is, is that, guess what? <clears throat> There's only one way. God's way. God made life. He meant for it to be one way, and it is his way. And the funny thing about life is sometimes we can't see the truth. We can't see what is truly in front of us. And, and to give you an idea, i got a story for you. There's, uh, there's this man who loved to go on walks. He loved nature. And he'd go on walks all over the place, and he'd always take his dog with him. His dog loved to go on walks with him. And one particular summer day, it was very, very, very hot. We're talking Alabama, Louisiana got together and decided it's going to be really hot today. And that's how muggy it was. Well, he had a drink. He was fine, but his dog didn't have anything. And you know, who wants to have dog slobber on your Dasani bottle? So he wasn't going to give any to the dog. But they walked past a lake. And he's like, okay, we'll let the dog drink out of the lake. Well, the dog wouldn't go to the lake. So the man thinking, okay, my dog, he can't, you know, resist a good game of fetch. So he picks up a stick, he throws it into the lake, and the dog went to get the stick. But he didn't go into the lake. He ran on top of the water grabbed the stick, ran on top of the water, and put the stick back in front of his master's feet. And the guy was looking at his dog going, wow, it's really hot. And he picked it up again, make sure he's not crazy. He throws it out farther. The dog runs on top of the water, picks up the stick, runs back on top of the water, and puts the stick back in front of his master's feet. And the guy's sitting there going, I'm going crazy. But he had an idea. I'm going to come back tomorrow to this lake with my dog, and I'm going to bring a friend because there was no one else around looking at his dog running on top of the water. So the next day came. It was just as hot. They get to the lake. His friend says, he looks at his friend, and he goes, hey, watch this. He picks up the stick. He throws it into the lake, and the dog ran on top of the water, picked up the stick, ran back on top of the water, and dropped the stick at his master's feet. And the man looked at his friend and said, did you see anything different about my dog? And the man said, yeah. Your dog can't swim. Now, as, as silly as that, that story is, you know, the problem is many Christians are like that friend. You know, the, the, the friend couldn't see the miracle of the dog running on top of the water. And he, in his mind, he saw something else. And for him to understand it, he made it something else. So the problem is Christians are like that. I mean, people are like that, but Christians especially are, are like that. They couldn't truly see the miracle. And, and our first point is that sometimes our understanding of the truth is actually a misunderstanding because of what we think we see. Now, the reason that truth doesn't always set well with us is because sometimes, if not most of the time, we don't like the truth. We don't like to be confronted with the truth. So in, in our nature, we tend to twist the truth. We tend to bend the truth. We tend to form it in the way that makes us feel most comfortable, and that's what and how we live with. And when we do that, we do something that we're told not to do. We begin to imitate the world. 
we begin to conform to the world. And if everybody, if y'all would turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we're going to read something that's a charge to us. If you're using the Bibles in the chairs, it's uh, page 803. If you're not using our Bibles, it's uh, between Acts and uh, 1 Corinthians. But chapter 12, verse 2 of Romans. But as we're getting there, what happens is when we, when we imitate the world, we're running into something that we don't need to run into, and that's, that's the word called compromise. We make a way for something that is not supposed to be. So Romans 12, chapter 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's two parts to that, and it's, it's really simple. The first part of it is don't conform to the ways of the world. Don't do this. Don't conform to it. And one of the ways that the enemy has been able to distract, especially Christians, is through compromise. Now, compromise, if, if you're married, you know that compromise could be a good thing, right? Okay, some of you are laughing and the wives are looking at you. Hey, look, we had a compromise thing happen the other day. My wife and I, we were shopping. And she picked out a shirt. She said, try this on. And I said, no. And she said, why not? I said, because I don't like the shirt. I'll never wear it. She said, try it on. It'll look good on you. And I said, no. So we compromised. <laughs> How do you like my shirt? Well, the word compromise means a settlement of differences by mutual concessions. It means an agreement reached by adjustment of conflicting or opposing claims or principles. So what happens is many times we compromise, and, and sometimes the compromise is good, but when we start substituting what is good for what is evil, that's where many Christians fall short. See, there's, there's, there's no gray. It's, it's either black or white. It's, there's no gray. It's either good or it's not. And I'm not going to I'm not going to dumb it down and say it's either good or it's bad. It's either good or it's evil. It's either God or it's not. And we start compromising the things that he wants us to do. Guess what? We're starting to twist and turn and pull God the way that we want him to be, and that's just not going to work. So, unfortunately, that's where many Christians fall short. Compromise can start off innocently. Have y'all ever been in a conversation um, perhaps you've uh, you've even said this before? Um, have you ever seen uh, or heard a conversation where somebody has ended uh, the point with, well, that's the way the world is, or that's just the way it is, or that's life? The problem with that statement is most likely you're talking about something, one, in a negative manner, and two, you're leading that person to believe that there's nothing you can do about what it is, that that is the status quo and that is what you have to do. And let me, i got to tell you something. That is, that is not God's way because just because something is just the way it is doesn't mean that's the way it's supposed to be. See, there's a difference. And as Christians, we are not supposed to settle. We are not supposed to compromise for something that is wrong. We're, we're supposed to act certain ways. We are supposed to live certain lives. As Christians, we have a responsibility to do that. And as Paul wrote, to not conform to the ways of the world. Ever hear that saying, um, the devil is in the details? Have you ever heard that saying before, the devil is in the details? I've always wondered what, what that saying meant. And as I was preparing for this message, it got closer and closer to me what it meant. It basically, the devil is in the details is basically another way of saying that if you pay too much attention to the big, I mean, if you pay too much attention to the details, you'll miss the big picture. You'll miss exactly what it is that you want to see, and, and that is how the world works. It tries to conform you. It tries to change you. It tries to take you away from the big picture so that you can lose focus by being so busy doing th even if you're doing things for God. If the enemy can take your focus off of God, then they've won. 
Because guess what, people? God is the big picture. We're supposed to keep our focus on him. And focusing on God is what allows us to see his perfect will. If we focus on God, that's what we'll see. If we take our eyes away from him, guess what? We're in trouble. God wants us to know his will. He tells us this. He, he gives us wisdom on how to attain this. He, he, he gives us words. He gives us knowledge. He gave us wisdom on how to get to that because by knowing God, we will know his will. The Apostle Paul wrote to another group of, of people called the Galatians, and he told them that, uh, in fact, it's uh, Ephesians, I'm sorry, Galatians uh, 15, 17. Um, You don't have to go to there. I'm just going to read it for you a little bit right here. It says, uh, he told the Galatians that we are to be careful how we live, that we should be wise and make the best of every opportunity, that we are to not be foolish, and we are to understand what the will of God is. He wants us to know his perfect will for us. But the problem is sometimes we get distracted, and, and even worse, sometimes we get trapped. How many of y'all have ever watched the, uh, the outdoor channels, the hunting channels and stuff like that? All the men are going, yay, and all the women are going, ah. I understand. Well, sometimes on those hunting channels, what happens? They, they not, it's not just a bunch of guys sitting and hiding in trees, blowing animals away. They, they, they sometimes teach you some stuff, and sometimes they teach you how to trap an animal. Well, on the show, what happens when they actually trap an animal? Yeah, later. The animal fights like mad to get out of the trap. The animal knows it's caught. The animal knows that it's, it's got suckered in. Well, the problem is most Christians don't even know they're trapped. It's that whole compromise thing. We take truth and we twist it and we form it to what it is that we're comfortable with and we walk on. So not only has the trap been set, it's been sprung. And unlike a wild animal trying like crazy to get out of this trap, we walk further into the trap, compromising more, compromising more. And pretty soon, that trap becomes our identity. See, our identity is supposed to be in Christ and and not the things that we can't do. Because the Bible says we can do all things through Christ. We've got to keep our focus on him. But the Christian generally will not only stay in their trap, but they'll go further in. And once this happens, it gets harder to see. It gets harder to focus. It gets harder to see the big picture because in this trap, we compromise so much, we start focusing on the little details. And those little details keep us away from the big picture. Let me give you another idea. There's just In your mind, pretend there's a factory. And outside of that factory, there's this, there's this night watchman. He's, he's the guard. And at the end of the shift... You know, he watches all the employees walk out. Now, the the job of the guard is to make sure nothing from the outside of the factory comes into the inside to harm or steal or anything like that. Well, his job is also to make sure that the employees aren't doing anything wrong either. So here he is, this, this night watchman, and at the end of the shift, one of the workers comes around the corner, and he's got a wheelbarrow. And in the wheelbarrow, there's a little box. And the guard steps in front of him and goes, Whoa! what do you got? And the guy goes, I have a small box. The guard says, well, I know that. What's in the box? And the man says, well, you, you know all that sawdust that accumulates on the floor at the end of the day? We have to sweep it up. Well, I'm doing something at the house, and I need some sawdust, so I just put it in this box. The guard opened it up. He looked in. Sure enough, there was sawdust. He put it back. He said, on your way. Well, the second night came. Here he comes around with a, with a wheelbarrow and a small box, and the guard lets him go through. Third night, wheelbarrow, small box, lets him go through. Fourth night, wheelbarrow, small box, lets him go through. Fifth night, the guy comes around the corner with a wheelbarrow, and the guard's like, all right, stop. What do you got in the box? And the man said, same thing I got every night, sawdust. He opens it up, sawdust, puts it back. And the guard goes, ah, you're stealing something. I don't know what it is that you're stealing, but in my gut, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're stealing something. So the guard stopped for a second and finally went, okay, just tell me what it is you're stealing, 
and you won't get in trouble. I won't report you. I won't turn you in. It won't go on your record. We won't fire you. Nothing. And the man says, you won't turn me in? No. Says, okay. I'm stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> well, like the guard in that story, guess what? We get so preoccupied with the small box. We get so preoccupied with the details that we couldn't see the big picture. See, being able to see God's will for us is, is, as a Christian, it's not a plus. It's not a perk. It's not a right. It's a necessity. Knowing God's will for our life is a necessity. We need to know God's plan so that we can walk with him. Now, have y'all ever been, uh, let me give you an idea of how quickly these, these details can, can think, get, get to you. Sorry, I'm stuttering here. You know how, many, how these uh, details can get to you, how they can stop you in your tracks, how these things can just jump out at you? Have y'all ever been in a conversation with somebody, you're just talking away, and then suddenly a little speck of dust or a grain of sand flies into your eyeball? And then suddenly you just went from being an absolute normal person to having a full-on seizure trying to get this thing out of your face. You know, sometimes it's that grain of sand that gets in our eye and distracts us so much that we can't even focus. It's, it's the, the little things that, that jump on us. So how are we supposed to regain our focus? If we've lost focus on God, how do we regain our focus? How do we come back to him? Well, Romans 12, 2 tells us. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what does that mean? Well, if, if you are transformed by the renewing of, renew of your mind, if you are focusing on God, guess what? God is the same. He doesn't change. He's not changed from the beginning. He's not going to change at the end. He's not going to change now. So if he's the same, then who's going to have to change? Us. And if we focus on him, we will change. We will change. As humans, we, we tend to get everything backwards. We think that we have to do something, the little things, in order to achieve the big things. Well, with God, it's backwards. Sometimes, I mean, people, we think that we, we have to do the little things in order to spend time with God. We think that we have to read our Bibles. We think we have to pray. We think we have to do good things for people. We think we have to do that in order to spend time with God. And that's not the way it is. We need to spend time with God. And as we do that, we will be in line. So don't try to get everything done in order to spend time with God. Spend time with God and everything will get done. It's just bringing our focus back to, to, uh, to him. And the secret is not to be so bogged down in the details. Because if you focus on God solely, guess what? You will be constantly renewing your mind. You will be constantly renewing your mind in him. Now, is it hard to keep your eyes on God? Yeah. Sometimes it's really hard. But it's part of the road that we have to travel. It's, it's part of the, the experience of something called unconditional love that he has for us. Because why did he make us? Well, because he loves us. But he, he, see, he didn't make us to love us. He made us so that we would love him. There's a difference. I have a relationship with my wife. I love her. But I don't force her to love me. Because if, if I had to force her to love me, that wouldn't be much of a relationship. Well, transfer that to God. God didn't make us to force us to love him. That's not love. That's robotics. He gives us a choice of whether or not we're going to love him. And he loved us so much that he sent his son. Jesus said that he came that we would have life. 
life with him. He came that, that he didn't come so that we can live any which way that we want to. He didn't come for any other reason than to set us apart for God's glory and, for, and to include us in the big picture and to include us with God. Think about it. He came into this dirty, nasty, polluted, sin-ridden world. Why? He ended up dealing with sin that we, so we didn't have to. Why? He ransomed us. Why? He cleaned us. Why? He restored us. Why? Because he loves us. He finds worth in us. There's worth in you. And I can tell you right now, one of the things that the, that the devil will distract us with is he will lead you to believe that you have absolutely no worth at all. And that's one of the prime things that keeps his children from coming to God. And I've got to tell you something, he finds worth in every single one of you. Does anybody know what this is? What is it? It's a $100 bill. Yeah. Cool, huh? <laughs> now the youth are awake. <laughs> Sweet. Maybe I should do this every Monday night. Um, it's a $100 bill. It's crisp. It's new. It's got a little bit of a crease on it, you know, from where I, I folded it in my pocket. But it's straight from the bank. It's brand new. How much is it worth? $100. Okay. Now, I want you to pretend that this $100 bill is you. It's $100. It has worth. It's beautiful. It's fresh, straight from the bank. Well, sometimes in life, what happens to us? We go through things that leave us feeling like that. Crumpled up, bruised, beaten, bleeding, feeling like we're worth nothing. What do I have in my hand? How much is it worth? Really? It's, a, it's worth $100 still? Why? Because it still has its value. It still has its worth. Well, you know what? Sometimes in life we don't just go through being crumpled up. Sometimes we get thrown. And sometimes some jerk will just come along the way and scrape us. Where'd it go? It gets stuck on the bottom of my foot. <laughs> now we're dirtied. We're beaten. How much is this worth? Really? I got a question for you. If I lost that $100 bill, how much, it would, how much would it be worth then? How much? $100. So even if I lose the $100, we're worth, it's, it's worth $100. If we're lost, we still have value to him. No matter what you think about yourself, let me tell you something, guys. There's nothing you can do to convince me that there's no worth in you. God loves you. He ransomed you. He ransomed the ones who are here who know Jesus. He ransomed the ones who are here who don't know Jesus. And if you've lost your focus, you have an opportunity right now to regain it. And it's simple. For those who know Jesus, it's as simple as saying, forgive me. For those who don't, Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It's as simple as that. Because it's with your mouth that you confess. It's with your heart that you believe. And if that's you, I would encourage you right now where you sit, just say something in your heart, simple as Jesus, I believe in you. You are Lord. I'm a sinner. I can't do this on my own. I believe in you. If that's you, I would encourage you to do it. 